Um, I, I think we're going to get started. My name is Courtney Worrell. I'm the president and CEO of the Waterfront Alliance, and we're just really pleased to have you here. This, this webinar today is an extension of our City of Water Day celebrations, which took place this summer in July and included not only events all around the region, but, but artists at the Blue Line at the South Street Seaport area of Lower Manhattan. And we have the artists with us today who were part of many exhibits and demonstrations and, and performances to talk about the intersection of climate change and art and some of the major changes that we're seeing taking place right now in our region and, and on the earth. So uh, we're gonna start out with um, uh, 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 Dr. Jackie Osterman from Columbia University, and then we'll follow up with conversations with the artists, and then we'll open it up at the end for questions and answers. So um, I lost my screen. Okay, great. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Jackie Osterman. Uh, who will be speaking next. Um, Dr. Osterman is an assistant professor in earth and environmental sciences at Columbia University. Her research focuses on understanding sea level rise and ice, 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 sheet, uh, sorry, ice sheet change from decades to thousands of years into the past. She does so mostly using large scale com computational models, but also integrates field work and work with local communities. So. Dr. Osman, thank you so much. And we're just so pleased to have you today. Thank you very much. Let me get started. Uh, try to get this set up. Okay. Can you see my um, screen now? Does that work? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you our super mini briefing about the latest IPCC report that came out just a month ago. It's a sixth assessment report. And um, the IPCC report is written by scientists and for stakeholders uh, and for the general public. And often it goes to kind of policymakers um, who use that for, for making decisions. It's written by a very large team of scientists that review and synthesize a huge number of scientific um, publications. Once a draft is written, it's reviewed by more scientists and iterated on, um, and then eventually released to the public and released to the governments. And you can go on the website and download the full report. You can download um, oh, um, summaries, et cetera. There's a lot of material. You can download slides like the ones that I'm using here. Um, these reports come out every six to seven years. And as I said, the sixth one came out just last month, and I'm gonna give you a super brief overview of it. Um, so the things that they concluded is that recent changes in the climate are widespread, they're rapid and intensifying, and they're unprecedented in thousands of years. And they demonstrate this here with a couple of graphs um, where we have time and years here on the x-axis and temperature in degrees Celsius on the y-axis. And you see how temperature changes have sort of been hovering over like around zero degrees um, over you know, the last 2000 years, but te temperatures have really rapidly increased over the last 150, 170 years. And if we look at this last 170 years and blow it up, you see that this increase really happened since 1950, 1960. And one of the major conclusions that they really also hammered home on in this report that it's unambiguous that this is a human influence on the climate that caused this warming over this time period and that it is unprecedented in the last 2000 years. Um, climate change is already affecting every region on earth in very different, in multiple and different ways. Um, and the changes that we experience will increase with further warming. And this includes effects such as extreme heat, heavy rainfall, drought, fire weather, ocean warming, ocean acidification, and um, sea level rise. These changes are gonna happen globally, but they're gonna vary quite a bit from region to region, it's, uh, including effects such as sea level rise that can be quite different from one coastline to the next. Um, a, a big focus of, as a result, a big focus of the report has been on regional climate information. And I won't go into the details, but about a third of the report is dedicated to that. <laughs> it keeps skipping slides, one second, sorry. 
There we go. Um, there's no going back from some changes in the climate system. This is particularly true for sea level rise, for example. However, some changes could be slowed and others could be stopped by limited warming. So if we look at projections, this is again, time and temperature here on this graph. And we have the observed record in black and then different projections into the future. Um, there are low emission scenarios in blue and high emission scenarios in red. The low emission scenarios essentially would keep us around one and a half degrees warming relative to pre-industrial times, while the high, high end scenarios are more four to five degrees of warming. And just like the other effects, warming will also not be uniform across the globe, um, but will be spatially varying. It will be get hotter than that average number in the polar regions, particularly in the Arctic, as well as on land and not quite as much as this average in the oceans and particularly the Southern Ocean. Come on slide. <laughs> Sorry, computer is struggling. Oh, there we go. Yes, okay. So um, what do we need to do to stay at kind of the lower end of the um, temperature range? So uh, there are different greenhouse gases that contribute to warming, but the main one is um, CO2. And it shows here the CO2 emissions on the y-axis against time again. And what we're seeing is that really, um, if we want to stay within one and a half, two degrees of warming, emissions are, should really not increase any further. We're about at 40 gigatons of CO2 per year. And in fact, they should start decreasing by 2025 and be negative, so we should start re sequestering CO2 out of the atmosphere um, by 2060 or later this century. In contrast, if we have, if we are on this track to um, high temperatures, this would be in line with kind of just continued rising emissions, which is what, of course, is happening right now. Um, so the last thing I just wanted to point to what this means for sea level changes. Um, so again, we have the um, observed record here on the x-axis of what has already happened. We are looking at sea level change on the y-axis here. This is one meter, this is two meters of sea level rise. And the different scenarios kind of group around half a meter to a meter of sea level rise, depending on these emission scenarios by the end of the century. There is... Uh, there are scenarios that are unlikely but have very high impact. So there's still a lot of questions about ice sheet stability um, under warming that really drives uncertainties um, up. And as I mentioned in the beginning for sea level change, really if we look into the broader future, so by 2300, um, sea level will rise even in a low emission scenario, which was one of the, it is, is this blue bar here, will rise by half a meter to three meters. But if we continue with high emissions, sea level rise can be multiple meters up to even 15 meters, which cannot be ruled out based on the report. So we're locked into sea level rise and we need to kind of figure out what to do with that no matter what. Let me just end on one slide if it loads. I think these are really high resolution slides. Maybe that is the, is the problem here. So um, just to summarize here, to limit global warming, strong, rapid, and sustained reductions in CO2, methane, and other greenhouse gases are necessary. Um, and that doesn't only help um, climate change, but it actually also improves air quality. And I'm going to stop here. There's a lot of information on the IPCC online if you're interested. They also have a great frequently asked questions document on their website um, if you have any questions. And I'm going to stop here and I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm happy to take any questions if there are questions um, at this point. But I'm also very happy to answer questions if there, if you wanna put it, questions into the chat and I can answer them in the chat during the, during the panel discussion. Well, thank you, Dr. Osterman. Um, do we have it? I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I think we can move on and I'm going to pass it off to Sarah. Okay, hello. Yes, I'm looking forward to sort of talking about all of this in relationship to the art. Um, my name is Sarah Cameron Sundia. I'm an artist working at the intersection of performance art, video art, and public art. I'm also 
a co-founder of Works on Water, um, which is a experimental organization dedicated to art that's made on, in, and with the water. Um, and I had the privilege last year of being one of the artists involved in Art of the Blue Line, which was very exciting. Um, I projected my work, uh, my ongoing series of works called 36.5, A Durational Performance with the Sea. And I'm so pleased to have, be able to be in conversation with Nathan Hemingway, Nate Dorr, and Lynn Newman um, today with, um, with, and to talk about the works that they just showed at Art of the Blue Line. Um, so to give a little bit of an introduction, um, Nathan Kensinger and Nate Dorr have, for the last 15 years, they've been collaboratively documenting the waterfront of New York City, photographing and filming as its post-industrial landscape is transformed by the new mega developments. And during the past six years, um, they have been creating a collection of short experimental documentary films about the waterfront of New York City. These films immerse viewers in polluted salt marshes, wild forests, abandoned mansions, and eroding coastlines to observe firsthand the impacts of storms, floods, pollution, and unsustainable developments. You're seeing some of these images that they projected um, at the seaport uh, on your screen right now. The intent of these artworks is to creatively engage audiences of all backgrounds with the difficult questions that are raised by climate change, environmental justice, coastal resilience, and waterfront access. To that end, they have exhibited in many different venues, including public art projects, site-specific video installations, museums, galleries, conferences, and film festivals at venues such as Queens Museum, Museum of the Moving Image, National Lighthouse Museum, ACMI, which is Australia's National Film Museum, Doc NYC, Rooftop Films, the Princeton Environmental Film Festival, and the Imagine Science Film Festival. Um, also in site-specific installations at the Brooklyn Navy Yard and Governor's Island. Um, and then Lynn Newman of Artichoke Dance Company is our other panelist. Um, Artichoke Dance Company works at the intersection of performance um, innovation, environmental activism, community building, and civic engagement. The company creates movement works and creative experiences that examine our relationship with and impact on nature. Model scientific phenomena, reveal human triumphs and faults, and envision a sustainable future. So for the Art of the Blue Line Festival, they performed Water Rises, which is a reflection on the energetic nature and power of water an inquiry that they've been pursuing since Hurricane Sandy hit almost nine years ago. The company is known for creating and performing in what they call trashin, which is fashion made from trash, to exemplify the overconsumption in our culture and envision a more sustainable way of being. Director Lynn Newman is an association of performing arts professionals, leadership fellow, and she serves on the steering committee for 350 Brooklyn and is a member of Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice. So we're very happy to all be together here. Um, and I want to just kick us off um, with, uh, so we, we have some of these images that you've just seen of the, how these works were exhibited and shown um, recently at Art at the Blue Line. Um, we want to just start off by talking about the role that art has in environmental and climate advocacy. Um, so I'm wondering if you, each of you, you three artists, Nathan, Nate, and Lynn, if you could all talk about your take on that. What do you think the role is of art in environmental and climate advocacy? And, and how do you think about that in relationship to your work? Sure. So um, I guess I really believe that giving people hands-on experiences them into contact with recyclables or trash in order to make things. Um, it could be um, even in just the collection of it. So the, the first, as an example, the first um, piece that I used plastic pollution to create sets and costumes um, was Plastic People of the Universe. And we, uh, I called it the piece to, to collect the six pack holders that soda and beer comes in. 
and um, realized that I, I got three neighborhood pizzerias um, to save their plastic six pack holders for me. And within two months, we had 5,000 of them. And it was like, oh my gosh, um, you know, it, it, it brings up a whole nother, maybe people are drinking too much soda. So there's a health issue potentially there, but you know, it's, it's an item that is just more of a nuisance than anything. It takes the, the people that work at the pizzeria more time to get the soda out of those things than it's even worth. So, you know, what, what is convenient and what is inconvenient is something that I think about a lot. So um, hands-on materiality or getting people into space of a place in which we're working that could have a compromised history or potentially compromised future, um, which they're pretty easy to, to come by. And then um, another thing that I've been thinking about lately, because often art is used as an awareness raising tool or an educational tool, um, and it occurred Like, what does the arts have? The arts have people who want to be there and they're willing. So um, what I've been working on the last couple of years uh, is, is trying to embed some actions into the performances so that it makes, um, it gives an entree into um, uh, environmental and political activism, which we need a lot more of. Um, and uh, um, at, at our shows over the summer, we uh, we distributed call scripts for the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act, with, Act which is a national bill, and um, and would have people like we would do a call bomb to like you know uh, to uh, elected offices, and um, you know everybody generally it was on like a you know they would come back the next day and there'd be like 50 messages um so you know it's 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 about introducing people to things that are relatively easy to do but it's it's things that we need to um to push push things in the right direction we need we need more people pushing in that direction um yeah so i'll stop there for now thank you yeah and it's so interesting because i feel like every artist has a really different um kind of level of like i think all of us who work in climate we're all sort of dealing with these questions in different ways. Um, and it's great to hear your take on that, Lynn. Thank you. Um, Nathan, Nate, what do you what do you think about this question, the role of art? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Can you hear me? Uh, oh, mm -hmm. Great. Um, yeah, thanks so much for having us on the panel today. Um, it's hard to, to speak about like all art kind of in relation to climate change because art is such a broad and vast thing. Uh, and not all artists are really looking at climate change at all. But within within that, you know, I think that what I value about art um, in, a, in addressing issues like climate change and sea level rise is that it, there's a lot more freedom within the art world to really uh, take different approaches to these issues. Um, artists, you know, have a lot more freedom to evoke emotions or ask questions that are not really being asked by other other fields, um, they're, 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 they're really not bound by the same kind of like rules and strictures in a way, like as, as a journalist, let's say, or as a scientist. Um, so within that, you know, just as an example, like one of the projects that we showed at Shoreline Change was a film called Managed Retreat that I made about the first managed retreat taking place in New York City, where neighborhoods in Staten Island right now are being demolished uh, because of sea level rise and people are moving away from the waterfront. Um, and I had covered this as, as a journalist uh, and gone and interviewed people and written about, you know, written about this story, talked with the governor's office of storm recovery about this story and, and done some pieces that were very traditional journalism, photojournalism pieces, but decided that I wanted to make a, a film about it. There was a very different approach. Uh, it, was a, it was a film that was intended as an art piece. And in that film, um, I didn't have the same constraints. I could really just kind of go in a different direction. And so I, I basically eliminated like the human perspective largely from the film. There were no interviews, there's no narration, there's very minimal facts provided. Uh, it's really a film that's meant to evoke a feeling of being at the front lines of sea level rise, a feeling of what it's like to stand there and watch as your home is destroyed because of climate change, a feeling of you know, seeing other species coming back to the landscape for the first time in maybe a century as, as the landscape is cleared up and turned back into wetlands. 
And I, and I felt like I had uh, less constraints. I could really tell the story in a much different way and try to um, evoke emotions, raise questions, not answer questions, um, very purposefully kind of immerse people in this place and have them come to their own conclusions and their own thoughts about what this process might be like. Mm, yeah, that's beautiful. What a great articulation of that. I feel like the time, yeah, that time and, and I love that you articulated that um, removing the human element because um, that's so clear and that is what kind of makes it so palpable um, in seeing those films. Highly recommend Managed Retreat and all of the films um, that everyone can check out. Um, Nate, what do you think about this? Uh, to that, I mean, I, I agree with everything that Nathan just said, but I would also add that in framing things differently than a sort of, um, you know, reportage or other approaches that are more informational, uh, art opens up questions that you're not asking, uh, like Nathan said, but also it, it reframes the questions entirely. So you can sort of imagine totally di a different range of questions and solutions than are in the strictly um, informational approach. And what we can imagine is shapes what we're able to consider as possible futures, as possible ways of uh, approaching these problems in the first place. And sometimes if you're stuck with just the, uh, the information, it's really hard to get outside of these direct sort of lines and endpoints and charts and, and think beyond that to what could really make a difference. Uh, so I think art has a very unique ability to push out of those, those boundaries. And also I think, as far as the relationship between art and climate here in New York, I think if your your art is engaged with the city, uh, it's hard not to have climate creep in there somewhere. Even if it's not your primary focus, you'd have to kind of actively ignore climate to have it show up nowhere in your work as someone who's engaged with the city of New York or anywhere else along the coastline or almost anywhere else, period. Mm. Mm. Yeah, beautiful. I, I love that idea or that, that you're articulating this um, possibility of it for imagining and reimagining. Um, that's so important. Um, and so to pick up on, um, on that, let's talk a little bit more specifically about Shoreline Change and all these, these films. Um, and then we'll come back to you, Wynn and Artichoke. Um, but uh, with Shoreline Change, can you talk just a little bit about and what went into deciding those those locations, or how you um, how you fo how you decided to focus on those specific spots? Nate, you want to take this one, or I, I came. <laughs> uh, I can jump in. Uh, I mean, this project is the extension of a long collaboration between the two of us, which you noted in your um, introduction to us. So. It wasn't so much um, that we made a list and said, oh, here we have to hit here, here, and here. It's just that these stories just emerged because we were out there in the city. And every time we saw something, um, these sort of points in the city where I consider them kind of discontinuities in the cityscape, where um, the normal narrative of the city gets broken up somehow, um, you know, stalled developments or places that are getting rapidly changed um, through different pressures or swept away by water or um, just all the places where the city is disrupted and all these themes kind of come to the forefront and meet together and intertwine. You can observe them more directly. Uh, so I feel like all the points in Shoreline Change are just places where that was happening that we just noticed and we had to be there because that was what was happening. And there is, that's just what we had to do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's these landscapes that are in serious flux. So we filmed uh, six different pieces that were included in Shoreline Change. And they look at you know wetlands that are endangered. They look at neighborhoods that are retreating from sea level rise. They look at neighborhoods where the the old an old forest, a century old forest, is being demolished to make way for a parking lot. Um, but the bigger picture, really, of shoreline change and of the work that Nate and I are doing is to look at this really interesting moment of transition in New York City, where you know we're we're dealing with the aftermath of the industrial revolution, the aftermath of horrible pollution that's gone into all of our waterways. And we're making decisions right now about what the future of New York City's waterfront is going to be. Um, and in some ways, you know, those decisions are, are, uh, are pretty flawed. And, and our films look at that, you know, like, why, why are we building 
thousands and thousands of new apartments in flood zones that were underwater during Hurricane Sandy and that are going to be flooded again with sea level rise. Um, so the works are kind of asking these questions, you know, looking at these places and saying, this is the layers of history that got us to this point and, and what will the future look like? Like what, what might the waterfront of New York City look like in the, in the decades ahead, in the centuries ahead, really? You know, we're tied, as, as was said before, we're locked into sea level rise now. And so we have to be thinking about what that means. Mm, yeah. And did you have, um, like, did you choose the locations or did you, did you like know intellectually that you wanted to study a particular part of the city or did you sort of go to many different places and then it kind of emerged where you actually um what you actually focused on and can you talk about and and sort of similarly i'm curious if um the form or the way that you filmed it the the sort of the experimental nature of the film letting time take shape, um, how you integrate some text in some of the films, did that emerge or was that something you sort of uh, decided before you before you approached it? I can tackle the first part, maybe Nate can talk about the uh, approach, but you know, we, uh, as, as was mentioned in our bio, you know, we've, we've been looking at all of New York City's waterfronts okay. over the last 15 years. And I'd say we probably photographed not the entire waterfront, but most of New York City's waterfronts um, at this point, visiting most, almost all of the creeks, the wetlands, the marshes, the industrial buildings, the different stretches of waterfronts. Uh, and, and within that, you know, we've, I've, I've written photo essays about them. We've created all sorts of photo projects and other art projects about the waterfront. But these, these places that we wanted to film were the ones that were going through some very uh enormous change like a real a real moment of flux where they were transforming from one very distinct landscape into something else entirely and so that's why we picked these locations is that we saw that they were going to disappear or you know that they were going to become a high rise or that people were pulling back from the water and tearing their houses down um and and that these were very visually interesting uh moments as well so that's that's kind of how we selected these these sites, and you can't really there's there's thousands of stories in on the waterfront of New York City, but you can't make thousands and thousands of of films that that would be that would be kind of difficult. Uh, although Nate and I are we are currently working on like five or six other films right now about different parts of the waterfront. Um, but I'll let Nate tackle the idea of like the approach to these places, how we decided to make these films. Yeah, uh, well. All of these locations, I mean, Shoreline Change isn't a closed project. It's open-ended and continuing just as the story of the waterfront is far from something that we can just summarize and say, there, we did it. That's, this is the New York waterfront, here it is. Uh, no, no, that's constantly ongoing. So these are just a sampling of what was important right then that will be joined by other, thing, other spots. Um, there's, yeah, so many stories that could possibly be told and we'll continue trying to tell. Um, and in that, so each of these locations was chosen through rather different means. I mean, it all came together from a bunch of parts that each of us either together or apart wanted to look at more closely. And in that, the approach was really, to each spot was really generated by the site itself. Um, it was not a top-down um, project. It was very much a bottom-up project from observing and just being in, on location and filming and um, being a part of the city for over many years and then gradually seeing how to explore these locations and these stories in a unique way that brought out what we wanted to, to look at with them uh, and the questions we wanted to raise and what we hope people would consider. Uh, so yeah, I think every story has its sort of optimal form uh, and I hope we found some of those in this um, and they're all gonna be different. Totally, and I love the way you curated them together. They, it, Felt like a really natural progression and I'm looking forward to the the next ones that you guys release come out with um, over time. Um, let's shift to Lynn and Artichoke Dance and um, 
ask a couple of questions for you. Really different work. I remember seeing one of Artichoke Dance works in uh, the early aughts. And it's interesting to see where you are now compared to where you were. And I'm curious if you can just talk about a little bit about how has how has your work evolved, um, your your how your how you approach how your dances um, have changed. What was it seems like there was a critical moment of of shift for you. Give us a little more of that. Yeah. Sure. I mean, yeah, you know, I used to make pretty dances for the stage. Like that's kind of what I did. Um, there, there wasn't a whole lot of externalized content other than the aesthetics of what it was, although I was working around with this concept of gender neutral partnering. So somebody, someone could say, oh, it maybe had a feminist bent to it or was working in gender equality, but that wasn't really necessarily the, the, um, I, I wasn't overlaying any kind of like social message over it. Um, and then, uh, I, I ended up, when I moved to Brooklyn, um, I ended up adopting this old um, retriever. She was like eight and I'd never had a, like I grew up with dogs, but I'd never had a, a, a Labrador retriever and they try and eat everything. Like she was trying to eat everything that was like uh, on the sidewalk or in the gutter. And I just kept pulling things out of her mouth and I was like, oh my God, it's all plastic. Like, and then I started to do this photo project and she was getting older and couldn't walk that much. So I started to do this photo project and we would only walk like from my, my door, which was half midway in the block to the end of the block. So like a half a block. And I would like, And be like, okay, some days there's like 20, some days there's like 150. And then I had to do this whole thing of like, okay, pieces that are that big don't count you know, and it was like microplastics. And then I was like, wait a minute, but they do count, right? As, as you like get deeper and deeper into the, into the research. Um, and what, what got me interested in water was I was actually, I, I was just wondering like, what, where does all this litter on the street go? Cause we, as we know, the, um, the street sweepers come barreling down the street and they don't really pick anything up. They just kind of move it around. Right. So, um, so it, we have combined sewage overflow system in most of New York here, which means that the water from your, um, your apartment or your, your office it goes into the same pipes as the water from the street when it rains, which means that all that litter on the street goes um, towards a, a um, filtration uh, and treatment plant. Although with climate change, we get deluges of water in a short amount of time, not sprinkling, um, sprinkling over many, many hours. And with the population density increase, there are just a lot more toilets flushing. So the system doesn't have the capacity to handle all the water during rainstorms. And we have combined sewage overflow, which means it just goes rushing out into the surrounding waterways untreated. So um, I guess maybe from, from a different perspective, like um, Nathan and Nate, I've been to most of the shoreline in New York, but riding my bicycle, looking for all pipes and seeing if I can access them. So that was like my first tour of all, all the shorelines is like, after it rains, hop on my bike and go see literally um, junk or the, you know, uh, coming out into the surrounding waterways. So that was a big eye opener for me. Um, and then, you know, kind of snowballed from there. Now, uh, similarly, I guess to, um, to, Nate and Nathan, like I, I like to work, um, or I, I find myself working in places of change. And um, uh, I live near Gowanus, so that for 10 years have been kind of focused on Gowanus. But um, so to just kind of wrap up the, the question, yeah, I adopted a dog and it led me down this whole, you know, rabbit hole that I had no real intention of like going down, but here we are. And the more you know, the more you uncover, the more you're like, oh God, it just keeps getting worse and worse. Um, so uh, yeah, but the, yeah, yeah, likewise, I'm attracted to or find myself working in places of transition. And I just want to say to Nate and Nathan, your, um, your film uh, on Staten Island, I found haunting, haunting, and it really, um, I've, I've been doing a lot of advocacy with the Gowanus Neighborhood Coalition for Justice around an idea that nobody was bringing forward, which is, is it the best idea to have the largest scale rezoning in New York City in 20 years in a floodplain and like build all these high rises and move, you know, 
30,000 people into a place that's going to flood again. You know, it's like, is that, is that responsible city planning? And no one was asking that question, you know? Um, so I think we, we, um, at the same time as by eminent domain, the city is taking, um, you know, certain blocks to build the combined sewage overflow tanks so that the recent, you know, that the now uh, Environmental Protection Agency cleanup of the canal won't get dirty again. So it's like when we talk about the idea of people's homes, like there's something about managed retreat that I think is unpalatable for a lot of people, but in the same token, um, or there isn't the political will for it maybe, but but by the same token, it's like they'll take somebody else's home to build what they want. So it's really um, uh, this, uh, this dichotomy, which is, 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 uh, is false. And I think there's um, also a lot of equity issues around it. So one thing I was thinking about um, with Water Rises, which was the piece that we did at um, the, Art of the Blue Line Festival is, you know, uh, South Street Seaport was underwater and ruined It sat, it sat empty for years. And um, in one of the plans for um, mitigating water rise for lower Manhattan, particularly to protect Wall Street, is the big U, right? And the original plan was it went so far. And then people were like, but wait a minute, we're going to get flooded. And so then they extended a little bit more and well, we're going to get flooded. You know, the, the thing is, um, and uh, this was my inner inquiry into the energetic nature of water because it's it builds momentum, right? Molecularly, it builds momentum. And it's like the water is going to go somewhere. So there's also a plan potentially to to put a uh, a, a movable wall into the you know at the end of the Gowanus Canal. But it's like okay, then Gowanus might not flood, but Sunset Park probably will. Like where where is the equity in that? Right? We're 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 totally displacing our problems like like we have done with climate change for decades onto our neighbors. Um, and you know, it's it's a it's a local um, reflection of the global north, global south, you know, I, I don't want to say dilemma, but reality mm -hmm. actually um, is that there's it's totally inequitable and like that we really need to call out and um, and voice out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Lynn, for bringing up those really good points. Um, I wonder if, like, how do you translate some of those ideas into your dances, like in terms of your process? And what do you, how do you actually approach the dance making from that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I, we spend a lot of time at a place, like just observing what is going on here. What is the, what are the intersectionality of things? And then devise um, improvisational structures to try in choreography or in movement and like some of them completely fail and then some of them are like okay this is workable um for what it for what it is that we're seeing and observing in this place and then um we'll develop it into more set choreography and then you know the the part that i find fascinating to then ask is like what does this tell us or teach us about the place or what needs to happen or ourselves as humanity and one thing that we land on a lot is is like it's interconnected right and we all have to be listening and paying attention to what other people are doing and reacting to it we can't put you can't put your blinders on when you're trying to ensemble dance with somebody else and um really you really need to um uh uh it, it, it in some ways uh models co-creation and it models interdependence and it's like that's the type of society that we need to be living in not one that's putting the Um, it's something that we've landed on almost every piece that I've made, um, you know, uh, around a geographic location that comes up in, in some way, uh, way, shape or form. Mm, very cool. I love hearing about that. Thank you. Um, so we are now um, going to open it up to questions from the audience, I don't, we, we haven't seen too many questions in the chat, but maybe you guys have so. Oh, Joseph, Joseph has a question. Um, let's see, Joseph, uh, let's see. Joseph says, can you each talk about how we transition from awareness to action through art? How do you build a call to action into your work? So going a little further with specifics, I think on our, our opening. Kind of question that we were talking about. Can you, any other specifics you want to offer? 
from the three of you. I mean, I'm, I'm happy to, I'm gonna put a link into the chat. So mm -hmm. um, uh, I, I know Sarah and Nathan from a residency at Governor's Island. And at that residency, um, I met a photographer, Robin Michaels, and we've been working on a project together ever since called its connection to the fossil fuel industry. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's a page on that website where there's a call script there. You can just or or, or do the, you know, sign, do the online petition, do the call script, um, write a letter. Um, politicians do tell me that, you know, the calls are better than the online petitions. It's more impactful. Um, so or a personal email. Um, but anyway, um, so, yeah, I try and embed these types of things. And, um, you know, even though it's like, okay, paper not, might not be great, we'll have a scan the QR code for this um, uh, action. And just like, like I said before, we, we have an audience, they're there, they're willing. So let's take advantage of that and hopefully bring them to the next step of, of, of action. I'll, I can jump in and say, you know, I kind of get asked this question in different forms uh, uh, often. And, and, and I, I would sort of go back to the question and say, you know, is it, is it the role of art to create action? You know, if you look at a painting on a wall, are you supposed to go out and then change the world? Um, or is, or is art, can art take on many different forms? You know, art can be provocative, art can ask questions, art can, you know, be there just to look at and admire beauty. It doesn't have to necessarily cause someone to go out and solve climate change. And I think artists don't don't have to be uh, the people who offer the solutions. Like I don't have a solution for climate change. I'm not a scientist, nor a policymaker. I I can't solve the issues of climate change. But as an artist, I do value being able to bring things into the public awareness that are not being considered. And I and I view that more as my role, like to highlight things that are not being looked at and to try and put them in the foreground. Um, and I think that that itself is is uh, not necessarily a call to action, but a call for people to look at the world around them in a different way. So by highlighting, you know, some of these projects that are happening around the city to address climate change that people are just not thinking about, I think is a very important thing. You know, right right now, New York City is like a microcosm of of of. Uh, climate change and sea level rise problems and solutions. There's oyster reefs being built, there's seawalls being built, there's levees being proposed, there's horrible ideas like building, you know, condos and flood zones being proposed. Um, and, and we're not really looking at that. You know, I don't think New York City is really taking a close look at what its future is going to be and what its future could be. So yeah, I, you know, I, I don't really have art that I think is uh, calling people to go out and, you know, march in the streets or solve solve these issues, but it's more artwork that asks people to look more deeply at what's coming our way. Yeah, perhaps, oh, oh sorry, just very briefly, I'd like to say that perhaps if artwork doesn't provoke an immediate cause to action, which only a very certain type of viewer is going to respond to any artwork with, um, they have to already be kind of primed to take an action. I think that art has a deeper role in sort of penetrating the just whole worldview and consciousness and an almost subconscious um, creeping up of ideas and themes that then will hopefully inform all of the viewers' actions from then on because it becomes part of them on a deeper level. So that's my hope. Totally. So, Go ahead, Courtney. Oh, well, I, it's interesting. I was just wondering about um, what Jackie thinks because I, I think that same question is asked of scientists. Like, how how is... What is your expectation for science to to inspire people to take action? And I wonder if the answer that you have is is similar to what Nathan and Nate just said in terms of it's not the role of science to take action necessarily, and then there are only a few people. Or so I'm wondering your take on that. And then also I have one more question for you, Jackie, in terms of um, just some some. Uh, so answer that, and then I'd love to ask you one more question. So go ahead. Yeah. So I, I think, um, especially around the issues of climate change, there is kind of a shift in the mentality of scientists that it's that it is our role to to at least initiate action. Um, so and I think the the role would be through and I you know a report 
you know, that's kind of, <laughs> it's a lot less attractive than a dance or an artwork, right? Um, but that's, I guess, the medium that we use, um, as well as sort of getting involved in politics directly, doing talks, whether that's to a general audience or whether that's to kind of a politically inclined audience. Um, and so I, I think um, the time of like scientists being in their ivory tower and not having anything to do with the results of what the, the science shows is hopefully starting to be over. Um, and I think the scientists have a, have a role to play in, in taking and initiating action. Um, but how exactly that happens is of course a more difficult question because it's also, it's not what we're paid for and it's not what is rewarded in our promotion um, um, progress. So, uh, so building this into the system, I think is an important step in, in academia. That's great. And then the, the other question I have for you is listening to all of this, um, do you have any a dream art installation or, or <laughs> art, some type of art that, that would correspond with the things you think about and you worry about um, but just just wondering about that in terms of that intersection for your, you yourself personally with with the science that you're 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 an expert in and and then thinking about art and how that can play a role. Yeah, I think with um, sea level change specifically, it's a it's a difficult one because it's it's small changes. You know, if you talk to people, it's centimeters. Um, and, you know, I, I talked about kind of the scale at the end of the century, it's like half a meter to a meter, which is extremely significant. And especially the, the problem with slow sea level rise is that it's not necessarily the sea level rise that's going to cause the damage, but it's the storm surge on top of this rising sea level that's going to be a problem. But it's hard to, I think, I, or at least I struggle with like communicating that message because the magnitudes are small. I was actually wondering, um, this isn't on the topic, I guess, of the sea level of sea level change, but um, and I might might pass that question on to Lynn. But I was thinking about, but because personally, I think about a lot about pollution and trash as well, um, not as a scientist, but just as a citizen. <laughs> and I think it's an interesting um, topic because the scale of it is so hidden. With sea level change, you can visualize, and people do that right on the pier. What are going to be the changes, and where we're um, how high was Sandy at this specific location? And I think that's in that way, even though the urgency is maybe harder to communicate, I think the scale is easier to communicate. Whereas with trash, because it kind of vanishes out of, you know, when you put it in the trash can, I was wondering what, um, what projects you might have been involved with that kind of tried to visualize that aspect of, you know, the, the scale of pollution and, 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 and trash. If I, if, I, if I may pass that on. So if I thinking about, I guess, our projects, so that's just one that popped into my mind while I was listening to you all. Um, yeah, so I really started to get an understanding of the volume. Um, I, I targeted plastic bags for many years when the plastic bag legislation failed in, in I mean, it, it was passed in New York City, then it got stored at the state level. It's this, it was the same narrative that happened in California. Um, uh, common tactic. But um, I was in uh, artisan residence at the Alberta College of Art and Design, and I was going to be working with bags for the first time. And they put a, a to like bring their bags. And I was working in this public atrium, and I was like, oh God, nobody's going to bring bags. Maybe they don't have bags, even though I know like everyone has a drawer of bags somewhere that you don't know what to do with, right? So I shipped some bags from New York up to Alberta. And then I was there working for a week, and like day two, this atrium, which was, I don't know, a uh, hundred feet long by 50 feet wide and like three stories tall. It was like the corner of it was just like a mound of bags. And I was like, oh my God, how do I even like, what am I going to do with all these bags? You know, I had, um, I, I was making some costumes, but then I was working on a, a set piece that was, I wanted to look like a glacier. Um, and um, so, yeah, it was just like, they just kept piling in. And then I was like, oh my God. It was another one of those aha moments where it's like, this is worse than I thought. Um, 
one of the first ones I had is, is uh, we did a piece at Coney Island and Manhattan Beach and kind of co combined it with a beach cleanup, but we made a piece for sand and it's like, okay, people are picking things up on the beach. And then it's like, as you start to dance in sand, it kind of melds away. And it's like, oh my God, there's more trash down there. Like we're unearthing even more than we even thought was there. So it's like, oh God, this is really even worse than I, ex I could even imagine it, you know? So I think it's, um, uh, I think uh, the participation part of it is key. And then also, I mean, the part of the, the um, project with Robin is, is we did a big shoot in um, uh, the recycling facility in, in Sunset Park. Um, and uh, just to get on the tipping floor and it's like, here's me. And then here's this mound of trash. And it was just so, uh, and, and even in the hour that we were there, the amount of trucks that came through and the amount of barges that are there. And it's like, this isn't like, that mound is never getting smaller no, ma no matter how much they process. And in fact, it's all only gonna get bigger. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, having those types of experiences. And then I think one thing that, that um, we can do that I think is very easy as artists is we're in a position where sometimes people are take take offense to like, not, I mean, I don't, but some people are like, oh, the scientists are trying to tell me what to do and change my life. And I think as artists, like where people are a little bit more open to our messaging and we can kind of go in the back door and be like, you know, make one change. Like how hard is it? I'll give you this water bottle if you'll carry it around and not buy a plastic water bottle. And like try and talk about it in terms of, of what's, what's best for you. Like, do you really want to filling up with tap water, like you're being duped, you know? Um, so stop, uh, stop enabling yourself to, to, to be that person and, um, and take charge of something that's very easy to do. So I think we can like have those types of conversations in a casual way that makes them very approachable. Mm, yeah, it's a little bit of a, uh, we, we have the ability to connect one-on-one -on -one with individuals and sort of slowly shift um, shift perception overall. Um, that's so great. Um, I think that we're we're getting close to needing to be done. Um, but there, I just want to throw out two more things. One, um, there was another question about um, in terms of communicating the urgency, and it and it seems to me that um, some of this is about like how can science and art. Uh, scientists and artists be working together to all kind of have this approach, have us approach things from many different angles. Um, and I'm curious from from all of you on the panel, Nathan, Nate, Lynn, and Jackie, um, if there's one moment that where you felt like what you were trying to communicate was really did communicate effectively to an audience or to a person and something shifted. Um, and if there, if you have, if there's any last little anecdote you can leave leave us with, um, and or uh, if there's something that you're working on now, what's coming up next for you as you move forward? I, I can add just a short thought on that. I don't have a good anecdote, which is a little sad, but it makes me think that you know often the challenges that we're sort of teaching to the uh, preaching to the um, choir, right? With especially like with the IPCC mm -hmm. report, you know, everything I said in these quotes, you all know this, right? I'm just kind of recapping. Um, and the challenge is really getting to the people that don't have different, hold different beliefs, right? And con convincing them, but those are not the people that come to the events that we normally organize. So I think that's a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Good point. That's why public art is actually a beautiful thing. Thank you, Waterfront Alliance, for doing this. <laughs> Anyone else want to? Yeah, um, there's, there's several great questions in there. Um, but just talking about maybe, yeah, how reach, reaching people that, uh, to piggyback on what Jackie's saying, reaching people that don't necessarily think about these issues or that might not even uh, agree with the reality of climate change um, is always a fascinating thing. And I think, you know, that's part of what Nate and I have done is, is make works that can travel to many different worlds and many different audiences. Um, and, and my favorite conversations are, are, are often those. It's when the, when the 
when the films have reached people who might not have thought about these issues or who might think differently about these issues. You know, I, uh, going back to the film Managed Retreat, I showed that uh, in Staten Island and I was very trepidatious, very hesitant to show it on Staten Island, even though it was shot there because you know, there's a lot of people on Staten Island that might not necessarily embrace the realities of climate change and sea level rise, even though it's at their front door. Um, but the screening, as, as all of the screenings and all of our public art projects involved, it, it sparked dialogue and it involved dialogue. And, and the questions and comments that came out of that were really fantastic because people were, they understood the, the issue of sea level rise through a different lens where it was about their neighbors losing their houses and having to flee from storms that were going to destroy their, their, their homes. Um, and so it, people opened up and, and wanted to talk about this. They understood that like, you know, storms were coming, more storms were on their way. And then I, the film also showed at Columbia at a, the man, first managed retreat conference. And in that situation is very different because it was showing to an audience of all academics and scientists who don't necessarily look at artworks. I was the only artist at the time uh, at the first managed retreat conference at Columbia U University, or maybe one of the only artists and I showed the film there and the response was also fascinating because it was scientists and, and, and academics who were not necessarily looking at this issue from an artistic or emotional lens. And so there was the dialogue there again opened up into this really fascinating conversation about, you know, what does it actually mean to stand there and watch your home be torn down because of climate change? You know, what is it going to mean in the future when, when more communities have to, you know, destroy their own livelihoods and move away from the oceans or move away from flooding or move away from fires and extreme heat. So yeah, it's it's great to show these artworks in various permutations and, and to open up these dialogues. I think that's a valuable thing for the artists can achieve. And that's the beauty also of something, a public art project like Art Google Line, where you're getting a completely almost random sampling of viewers who had no, not necessarily even an intention of encountering art that day. And I got into conversations with so many people who just said, oh, what are you doing? Tell me about this. And then they'd come back with anecdotes of their own. You know, my cousin's place on Jamaica Bay flooded um, terribly like a month ago. And, you know, I didn't realize this was happening other places too. It just, you can see sort of this greater sense of what's going on forming. I, and I hope that happens when every time we get to show work like that. Mm, yes, thank you. Thank you all. Um, I just wanna also acknowledge that Evelyn and Marianne have put comments in the chat. Thank you so much for engaging with us and, um, and those beautiful anecdotes um, to wrap us up. Thank you so much. Passing it off to Courtney to close us out. <laughs> All right. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for, for moderating and thank you everyone for great questions. This was really fun and I, I hope there's a lot more. This is a, a ripe, ripe area for further exploration and participation and uh, can't agree more about the location of this being public art and the interaction with the public and who didn't expect. And I think that's a one of the powerful things about this. So Dr. Osterman, thank you so much for being a part of this. It was really great, even though I, you, you assume a lot of us know what you presented in the beginning about the IPCC, but um, not a lot of people commit parts of it to memory and some of it is actually new. So I wouldn't assume that that's the case. So anyway, um, thank you all so much. And thanks to the artists and to the Waterfront Alliance staff and to Cynthia Tam who put this all together. So have a wonderful climate week and we will see you next year, if not sooner. Bye-bye everybody. Bye, thank you so much. Oh, and my, uh, come to the gala on October 12th. <laughs> <laughs> jo oh yes, ways to get involved. Attend our events. We got our gala coming up on October 12th. We have uh, Rise to Resilience Coalition. That is all about taking action. RiseToResilience.org. And then you can always donate to the Waterfront Alliance. We hope that we are that at that intersection between science and action, art and action, and all things in between in terms of action. So thank you all for that. So let us know if you have any questions. There's our contact information. <laughs>